Time. That's seven times I said time, Mark. All right, I'll start it. <laughs> I'll start it. Get it out of the way. You've got a thousand jokes up your sleeve. Roll them. Roll a couple at me. No, I haven't actually, other than they've just simply changed the curricular at primary schools. It's now one, two, three, four, five, six, Manchester United, eight, nine, oh, 10, 11, see, 12. Okay, I mean, look, again, look, send me a can of seven up. I've already got a crate of them in the fridge here at work. Apologize to me! The whole thing. I mean, look, let's start there, shall we? Because none of us expected it. You didn't expect it either. What does it mean for your season, though, unless you make top four? Does it count? Well, it's, it, it's interesting because I was just talking to Lachlan about it. Um, in high standards in recent times. Um, but what does it mean? Well, it actually means a lot. It's Manchester United. It's the oldest rivalry in English football. Um, it's 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 a remarkable achievement. Seven goals against a very 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 good United side, or a United side that currently sitting third on the table. And so, in a funny kind of way, Liverpool might not end the season might end the season without a trophy, but that is a really historic, significant victory for the club because it is Manchester United. Had it been Southampton, again, I think you can ask that question: What does it mean in terms of the? season but historically that was significant for both clubs that is um another thing that you etch on the walls at liverpool football club and it was interesting just building up to that game how eric ten Hag played down anfield another one who played down anfield talked about oh look it's the same dimensions it's got air we use a ball it's got goals and he pretty much belittled it somewhat and yet you know you you listen to a, a, a lot of the sky pundits um, talking and you know there was a sense prior to that game starting that it was going to be a special night for Liverpool because of the, the Anfield vibe, the Anfield crowd um, and there was just something unique about it and why is it that so often these wonderful moments that we've seen in football whether you go back to the miracle in Istanbul, whether you go back to beating Barcelona 4-0 um, you know, needing to win by four goals to go through the Champions League in 2019. There was just something about Liverpool Football Club. They just find a way, don't they, of making headlines and doing the unthinkable. And I think that's what's so appealing. But it also just further enhances that rivalry between Manchester United and Liverpool. And sport needs it. And the English Premier League needs it. And I think the bigger question is, what does it do for Manchester United season? I, look, I think it will ignite Liverpool's season. I think we're starting to sort of see that front three of um, Nunes, Gapco and um, and the Egyptian King Mo Salah starting to click. A lot more urgency in midfield yesterday from Henderson. Uh, we're seeing Van Dijk. I think it's three consecutive games now with a clean sheet for Liverpool. So look, I think it'll I think it'll help Liverpool's season. The big question is how much psychological damage will it do to Manchester United? Can they hold it together? Um, and how does he manage his players now? And let's be honest, I think Gary Neville summed it up. You know, there were it looked like a team of sort of almost spoiled brats in the second half from Manchester United. And that's, it's unacceptable, isn't it? To be a Manchester United player and lose 7-0, let alone 7-0 to Liverpool. Seven seconds of silence, mate. There you go. That's my tribute to you. I'm moving on from it. I just gave you seven seconds of silence, all right? That's all you get. We're going on to another topic. Apologise to me! Adi Savir. John Curran said enough's enough. I do tend to agree with him. I thought that, you know, the, the, the getting off the field, the apology afterwards, perhaps that is all that it needs. However, however, Mark, if the judiciary comes down and says, no, 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 um, we've got to stamp this out. This deserves more than that. I'll accept that as well. I mean, in the end, what he did was stupid. I've been saying it for 24, 48 hours, though, is that we all do dumb things and we're all guilty of that. I I guess what the major surprise is is when somebody that you don't expect to do something really stupid does something really stupid. But where are you on the arty thing? Yeah, I'd probably expect that from someone maybe like an Akira Rawani before I probably did from an Adi Savia. But look, sport's about emotion. It's a gladiatorial game, clearly some niggle. Um, We've all been guilty at times. I mean, I play seven-a-side soccer on a Friday night and I've got to be honest, some nights half an hour after a game, Martin, I'm a little bit embarrassed by my behaviour. <laughs> Um, I've, I've got a little, I've got a little bit better as I've got older. Um, I'm sometimes a little bit embarrassed when I'm supporting my kids in their sport. Um, I'm one of those. 
Uh, so look, we, I, I don't have, I, I don't have, I, I get sick and tired, as I said to you previously, about us constantly trying to make out mankind's perfect and any little indiscretions unacceptable and it's going to have people switching off in their droves because how dare somebody um, not be of the highest moral standing and that's not true we're flawed um, I think we like a little bit of niggle I think historically the biggest sporting events in the world the most memorable ones you know you go back to the McEnroe's go back to State of Origin when it had its biff um, you go back to oh the ninety nine call on the Lions Fitz. tour, mate. Remember that we yeah, all loved yeah. it, didn't we? Yeah, we all love it. And so I, I just get annoyed that I, oh, you know, we're all about targeting the family. You know, they still don't take concussion seriously enough. And look at the crowds that are dwindling. You know, our, our players these days are taught what to say. You're not allowed to show any emotion at all. They keep telling us this is the right way, but all I'm seeing is diminishing crowds, diminishing interest because I think a lot of the colours being taken out of it. Adi Sevier comes off the field, he has a chance to think about it, he apologises, it let's move on. I mean, if this guy gets banned for that, why don't we just get rid of the haka? Because the haka used to have it in itself for the folks that didn't yeah, it? I mean, yeah. the haka's a, a war dance, it's a challenge. I mean, in itself, it could be deemed as uh, some sort of form of aggression. So, yeah, I, I'm I'm just over sport being dumbed down. Let, let, let's just get on with it. Let the players show some emotion. No one got hurt, did they? I mean, it's a gesture. So what? I mean... You know, and I know, Martin. I mean, you, you, you what? You still probably give people the fingers, what, four or five times a week, Martin? Oh, go on. You know I do, mate. Yeah, I mean, I know. I mean, you know, I'm down like down you on the sideline as well, mate. I mean, look, you know, I used to, I used to get into verbals on the sideline when the kids were playing sport. Anyone that used to yell or abuse the referee or linesman, I couldn't help myself. I had to go up and start talking to them and saying, "What's that about?" You know, I mean, look, it just you do do dumb things, as I say. I'd like to put a full stop on the end of it because what it. What it is doing is it's actually diverting from what the real issue about the Super Rugby Round in Melbourne is and was, is that it's a complete failure. Uh, You know, look, the Blues losing, and I'll get onto that in a second, actually was the brightest spark of the weekend because at least actually gave us something to talk about and actually gave the Aussies a bit of a boost and a bit of a fillip. But the idea that rugby, again, bunch of clowns running the sport that continue to take this round to a place where they don't want it. This is meant to be some kind of showcase for Super Rugby. There's, you know, a third of the ground is full at best over a weekend. And you just sit there and you go, you know, these people supposedly, Mark, have marketing degrees. These people are supposedly in the in the communications department. They, 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 they're meant to know what the hell they are doing, and yet constantly they don't give us stuff, mate. And this is more of New Zealand rugby, and I put New Zealand cricket alongside it, the same thing. All they care about is, oh, look, we sold it, we got this money, there's our bank balance. You're losing fans. No one's no one's turning up to watch this stuff. I mean, and eventually what's going to be, the, the cost of it is, is these administrators go on to bigger and better jobs. Of course they do, because they tick their KPIs and go, oh, look, we sold it to Melbourne for these amount of millions of dollars. In the meantime, you got empty grounds, and how good is that for your sport, mate? I agree, I agree. And but yet, you know, what, what suddenly you talk about the Blues losing, you've got the Artie Severe situation. But why do you have it in the second round of the competition too? I mean, we've all been waiting so long. It's been a miserable sort of um, summer. Um, you know, people do look forward to Super Rugby because it is the only form of sort of quality rugby left anymore. Again, due to the administration, due to those same people that you've just mentioned, and yet. So what do you do? The second round, you basically make it an exhibition, as you said, in the city that are not interested. I mean, it's just dumb stuff. Dumb. You're surely going, hey, let's lose the first three or four rounds to really get fan engagement. Let's just make sure that Auckland and the Blues get their fans along to Eden Park early in the season, show them a good time, show them what it's like in great weather. I mean, if you're going to have these ridiculous rounds, and I don't think you should have them, because again, I think it's just exhibition football in the finish, and you take the home ground advantage away, and I think that's significant. You know, you at least have it maybe week seven, week eight, when the competition's well and truly been established, but you do not do it in the second week, because you suddenly feel like, well, hang on a minute, we had some momentum last week, Oh, we've lost that momentum. Yeah. So when is the season starting again? And this is what I talk. This, you're 100 percent right, Martin. These people that somehow managed to get these jobs, it is amazing. There are just so many flaws in the whole recruitment process when it comes to employment. There are so many flaws in how some people can just interview. 
Um, it's too academic in its approach. I, I know really good people who interview really, really well who are absolute lightweights. I know some people who have got some pretty big roles in New Zealand rugby at the moment who I've had dealings with who I don't rate at the slightest. So I think of the biggest frauds in sports administration, but have ticked, as you said, the KPIs, but ticked the political correctness boxes and just know how to answer the right questions. But the moment, the moment you go a little bit below the surface and start tapping them and start asking questions and putting pressure on them, you start to see their frailties and then when eventually people finally realize that perhaps yeah hey they're not all they cracked up to be these people jump ship and jump on the next sports administration role as you say and it's a bit of a merry-go-round and we wonder why sports administration in this country as is as poor as it is and why we are so often talking about maybe, um, you know, New Zealand football and the way New Zealand rugby is being operated. Uh, you could argue the way New Zealand cricket at times too. And, and yeah, and, and I'm not sure how you change it. Apologise to me! Let's talk about the Warriors, mate, because I tell you what, it might have been Newcastle Knights, but any win in this competition is a win, and they will be breathing a huge sigh of relief, the Warriors, everyone to do with that club for getting that W, because the next four games are pretty bloody tough with the Sharks and the Roosters amongst them, now, and also the Cowboys amongst those dogs make out that four. But your thoughts on that, 17,500 down in Wellington, I thought that was a pretty good crowd. The next day, the Phoenix got 6,388, I think they announced during that game. And the Hurricanes, the challenges this weekend with both the men's and women's teams playing, is how many turn out in Wellington for the national game? Because this is, I feel, is going to be another humiliation for New Zealand rugby that the Warriors go down there and will pu- and will pull a crowd probably twice, if not three times as much as the rugby gets. Yeah, but I th- look, I think it's a unique situation. The Warriors going to Wellington, NRL is big nationwide. I mean, you're not just going down necessarily, are you, to see the Warriors? I mean, there's a large uh, Newcastle fan base, you know, as there is a large Roosters fan base. I mean, in this part of the world, it's probably the nearest thing we've got to sort of English Premier League football in terms of a broad spectrum of fan interest and a fan base. Uh, look, yeah, look, well done to the Warriors. I mean, it's so important for them that they kick the season off well, that they get ahead of the game, that they're not chasing it in the second half of the season when injuries do start to creep in and maybe travelling back and forward does start to take its toll a little bit. That's all you can ask. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I'm not the guy that's going to stand up and go, hey, finally, finally, I think we can smile as Warriors fans. I'm not that guy. I'm not even going to start making a decision on this Warriors team until sort of August. And I, I and and, and, and as I said last week, the Warriors have done that to me. That's not me about being a doom and gloom merchant. That is just simply the Warriors year in, year out. Um, yeah, look, um, uh, yeah, a, a, a really, really good performance because, again, they weren't playing at Mount Smart. Um, but, you know, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, a really, really tough road ahead. But that's, that's the NRL. Uh, every week's tough. Uh, there's no easy game. Uh, I mean, we, you know, you see that over the weekend. You see that, um, you, you know, you see that with some of the upsets that did happen in that first round. So, long way to go. Good start. Well done to them. Um, but yeah, just going on last week, I still put Sean Johnson in there with Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy, and the Easter Bunny. Apologise to me. I've waited, mate. Your blues, eh? Your blues, your puffed up, hyped up blues, mate. Look, it was a great result for the competition, I believe, because if the blues had to smoke the Brumbies, I mean, already we're going, well, look, why don't your Australian teams run off and play your own silly comp? We don't want you in here. We don't need you in here. You provide no actual competition. There's at least one good side. Worrying aspects for the Blues, or is it just the heat of the second half, second game of the season, and they'll come right? But what we saw, which which did worry me, was the same kind of symptoms we saw last year, that the play gets really disjointed, that they lose structure, uh, that everyone becomes a bit individualised, and I thought that that had been ironed out of, out of their game. Yeah, look, I'm still not, and I, I know that people will still tell me I'm wrong in this, I'm still just not convinced Akira, uh, sorry, Rico Awani is the centre. I, I, I think that, you know, in terms of putting players in space, in terms of sometimes you know, uh, passing at key times. I still think he's deficient there. Ironically, I actually think that this game in the second round might actually be what the Blues needed early on, just to remind them. But I think the more concerning issue for me, Martin, is once again, another New Zealand side that gets bullied up front, that gets bullied in the forwards a little bit, and suddenly they go wanting. Suddenly they don't have that ability to maybe match it. Suddenly they start to play a little bit helter-skelter. The structure goes out of the game. 
We've, we, we saw it against the Blues. I think it's, it's, it's something that creeps into New Zealand sides, and certainly we've seen it at the All Black level, at international level, where sides have figured us out. So that is going to be a concern. But, yeah, ironically, I actually think that loss might just be the reason why the Blues might end up going on and winning this comp. Um, but I, I look, just across it too, I think we've got to be concerned with the Highlanders. I no, I mean, just hand, just hand, the, hand I mean, the opera a bonus point every time they play. I mean, look, at this is a squad which is obviously subpar. It just goes to show, maybe this is the player drain come home to roost, mate. They don't have enough players. We don't have enough players in New Zealand rugby to yeah. put out five really good teams. We used to. We used to dominate this competition. It's been going for 27 yeah. years, but not anymore. But again, go back to the administration of New Zealand rugby. Go back to the televising of um, schoolboy rugby. That the stepping stone. Go and have a look at the demise of club rugby. Go and have a look at the NPC. And now we're starting to see the impact on that. They say, oh, yeah, but look, you know, they, they again, they only look at things commercially, Martin. And I go on about this every week, but you've got to have those forms of the game. And now we are starting to see the depth of New Zealand rugby starting to wane. You know, we, we've reduced it to five teams, five professional teams, and now suddenly you look at the Highlanders, what, our talent pool's now reduced to four teams mm -hmm. and then within that, and okay, we can look at Australia and go, yeah, but look at the Australians. So what? We're not Australia. We're New Zealand. We're the All Blacks. Its depth has always been our strength. And I think for the first time in the history of the All Blacks, whoever ends up coming in to take over from Ian Foster is actually going to have a lack of depth across a number of positions. Um, and this is, and I'll keep coming back, this, this is a 10-year thing. This comes back to not supporting grassroots. This, you've got to have top down, but you've got to have bottom up, Martin. And they haven't done enough to address the concussion issues. They've been too arrogant. You know, they haven't made themselves appealing enough to the fans. We've discussed that every week, but you've got so many other sports now that kids want to choose from. And rugby, rugby, still believe, yeah, but we're rugby. We'll be okay. No, no, we're rugby. We still can have our media managers telling all the media, no, we can't put a player up. We can't put one player out of the squad of 30 up for your radio program today or tomorrow because they're tired. They still believe they can get away with that mentality and they can't. And I'm just not sure, going back to that whole thing about sports administration, the so-called highly qualified people how can they not see this? It is so obvious. It is so simple. You can see it. I can see it. The average fan can see it. But these guys still, I don't know. I, I don't know. They still just have their, you can't see the wood through the trees, Martin. So I think that has got to be a real, real concern. But yeah, look, um, I mean, your Hurricanes, mate. I mean, what a great start. Two away wins straight up. How good are they? I mean, that's the question for me. How good are the Hurricanes? Can the Hurricanes go on and win this? You tell me, Martin. Devlin. Yes! Yes! Can they do it? The Platform.